Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Uh, my name is Katie Peace. I'm the Director of Communications for the Preservation League of New York State. We are excited to be partnering with the Tenement Museum to bring you today's webinar about social justice and preservation of place. And I want to say thank you to our program sponsor, the Peggy Ann and Roger G. Gary Charitable Trust. If you have found your way to this webinar but are not familiar with the Preservation League, we are New York's statewide nonprofit focused on investing in people and projects that champion the essential role of preservation in community revitalization, sustainable economic growth, and the protection of our historic buildings and landscapes. The League does this lots of different ways in every corner of New York State. Uh, we provide technical services, grants, including our signature Preserve New York and technical assistance grants that we offer through our partnership with the New York State Council on the Arts, our Seven to Save program of endangered historic sites, which we actually just announced. So go to our website and check those out. It's pretty exciting. Uh, we do public policy and advocacy at the local, state, and federal levels. We have our Excellence in Historic Preservation Awards, which we are currently accepting nominations for at this very moment, and a whole slate of online programs, including webinars like this one. And so today we're going to be looking at the intersection of preservation and social justice. So this sort of got put in my brain based on a conversation that we had earlier this year with Catherine Fleming Bruce, whose book, The Sustainers, looks at um, preservation and civil rights sites and how the act of preservation can in itself be an act of social justice. So sort of spiraling out from there, kind of wanted to explore the idea of preservation as a, a key part of an organization's mission, even if they're not themselves a preservation organization. So nonprofits that uh, focus on social justice in various ways and how the preservation and rehabilitation of their built environment can directly support their work. And so we're gonna have people from three pretty different organizations talking today about the work that they do, including Sarah Litvin, the executive director of the Rear Center of Immigrant Culture and History in Kingston, Maggie Oldfather, who's the facilities officer of Henry Street Settlement in New York City, Jeremy Dennis, founder of Moz Mount, Moss House and BIPOC Art Studio on Long Island, and Catherine Lloyd, who is the Senior Director of Programs and Interpretation at the Tenement Museum. And we're very excited to be partnering with them to bring this webinar together today and grateful to Kat, who will be moderating the group discussion at the end of today's program. Each of our panelists will have about 10 minutes to tell you about themselves and the work that they do. If you have questions for them while they're speaking, please drop them in the Q&A box. We will get to as many of those questions as possible at the end. Um, the chat will remain open for general comments, things like that. I will be monitoring that. So if I can drop links or anything like that pretty quickly, I will do so. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Kat who uh, will give a brief intro and then hand it off to Sarah. Thank you so much, Katie. <laughs> and hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited for the conversation we're gonna have. Um, and thank you so much to the Preservation League for hosting and inviting us to contribute to this important conversation. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to moderate. Um, and so, as Katie said, we're going to hear about the work at three really unique sites to really explore how do social justice and historic preservation intersect. Um, so we'll explore this critical issue both at each of these three sites, but then also we're interested in this conversation for the wider field. Um, and this is where your contributions will be really important. And we wanna hear your connections, um, your questions for what is going on within um, your area of the state, your organization. Um, and we'll really be, be looking at sort of what does preservation mean and how do we think about preservation in a community context? Um, how do we make our sites matter to communities around them? Um, and in particular too, we'll see through the Rare Center, Ma's House, and Henry Street, um, how are sites of historic preservation also meeting people's needs, um, acknowledging past um, and acknowledging the history through programming, through their organizational structure, um, and through service. So we'll cover a lot of ground. And um, you know, this question of, of sort of this intersection has actually been on my mind a lot recently. Um, the Tenement Museum, we're about to undergo a major preservation project ourselves in our tenement at 97 Orchard Street, where the museum began in 1988. Um, so really for the first time in our history, we're gonna be closing down 97 Orchard Street um, to care for the building. And in preparing for this project, I've um, been looking back at our own history as the museum and, really been reminded that the prospect even of a preserved tenement building um, was kind of radical in 1988 when the Tenement Museum's founders um, began looking for a tenement building. Um, and that for the founders of the Tenement Museum, it was actually um, just as important to think about the space as a space to share stories. So that it was 
uh, the building and the storytelling and, and the kind of idea of social justice that can come from that storytelling that was so integral to the museum beginning. And um, you know those questions of, of sort of what what is the work of a, um, a museum or historic site in in um, their contemporary um, communities um, has been on our mind a lot. And so I was really excited when Katie invited me to moderate the conversation today, and um, and also to learn more about the work that you'll get to hear about today um, from Kingston. Um, to the Lower East Side, to the Shinnecock Reservation in Southampton and Long Island. So we're, we'll see these three different sites um, and we'll start with um, Sarah Litvin um, sharing about her work and her organization's work at the Rear Center for Immigrant Culture and History. So Sarah, um, take it away. Thank you so much, Kat and Katie. Thank you for everybody being here. Um, and I'm so excited to have the opportunity to share some about our work at the Rear Center for Immigrant Culture and History. If you haven't heard of us before, that's because we're pretty new. Um, we opened to the public for the first time in 2019 in a meaningful way that we'd been open here and there before then. Um, and what I'm gonna share is really how our site uh, grew out of being a grassroots preservation project with a social justice idea and that idea then has become so deeply wedded into and sort of furthered along through the history that we've discovered and our process of preserving the site. So let me introduce you. I'm gonna share my screen. If I press the right button, that helps. All right, here we go. So just as a little context, um, we are about 90 miles north of New York City on the west side of the river, the city of Kingston, New York. And this is our site. This is our building where kind of our story all begins and grows out of. Um, we're at the corner of Spring Street and Broadway, which is in the Rondout neighborhood downtown in Kingston, New York. It's two buildings that are connected. This is 99 Broadway and 101. And it was always a business on the ground floor with uh, two apartments upstairs. So in a way, the history of our site is kind of similar to the Tenement Museum story, but on a much smaller scale. This was historically the immigrant neighborhood of Kingston and our name, the Rear Center, comes from the family who lived and owned in this building the, the longest, the Rears. They were a Jewish immigrant family. Um, and uh, many families who lived upstairs in this site as well, who came from other backgrounds. So a little bit of that history, here is our street back in the 1880s, 1886 or 1887 is the date on this photo. This was when the Barnum and Bailey Parade came parading up um, Broadway. Our building is just here on, on the right of the screen. And um, you can see really how densely populated this, this neighborhood was and had on either side of the street, uh, businesses on the ground floor and apartments upstairs, this kind of typical 19th century mixed use working class um, tenement style spaces. So a little bit into, you know, fast forward ahead, um, the Rear family, and here's who they are. They move into this building in 1908 and they continue to live on the second floor and to operate a bread bakery downstairs for the next 80 years. So this is Frank Rear, who, as I mentioned, a Jewish immigrant from Krakow, uh, his wife, Ada. And Frank and Ada had six kids of their own, as well as they had these two women in the back were from Frank's first marriage. So it, at one point, there were 10 people living in this two bedroom apartment and on the ground floor operating a bakery. And in fact, the 1916 coal fired oven is still there. Um, this family made amazing bread. They made rolls every Sunday uh, that served the whole surrounding Christian and Catholic community. Um, and they were closed on Saturday, which was their day of worship. And on Wednesday, they made rye bread and delivered it all throughout the, the city, first with a horse and cart and then with a truck. And, um, and they made pumpernickel as well. 
In addition, they were a, a neighborhood store. As you could see, this was a very walkable working class neighborhood at the time. Um, and many folks came in just to, to pick up something, but they became a hub. They became a real center for the community that was here. They continued this until they continue, could continue it no longer. And so as the story goes, one day in 1980, an aging Jaime Rear, he was the youngest in the family, he came downstairs and just said, we're closed. And that was it, locked the door and went back, you know, retired upstairs caring for his elderly siblings and pretty much left the space as it had been. Fast forward again to 2002, there's a group of folks interested in the Jewish history of the neighborhood here, the Rondout neighborhood. And as they get to the, the top of the hill where our site is, a man named Jeffrey Miller, um, oops, sorry, here he is on, on the left. He looks in the window and he sees that uh, in fact, not much has changed and starts asking about what is what is the story, what has happened here, um, and is able to meet Jaime Rear and actually have a conversation about donating this building to the Jewish Federation of Ulster County, an organization he was affiliated with. So this is the group of volunteers who um, together began a grassroots preservation project. They really had no professional experience in this field. And they went to state grants and through a couple of those, as well as a, a grant from um, a state senator's office, Senator Larkin's office, they were able to get $750,000 to do two major projects. One of which uh, you can see depicted here was a major excavation of the courtyard in which they found the privy vault. And, and there were many interesting artifacts that came from that as well. So from 2002 until 2017, this was an all volunteer project, mostly with a focus on um, preservation, stabilizing the building really, um, but also with this idea to have this space, not just tell the history of this one family, the Rears, but actually of the many different immigrant groups who have come to Kingston both in the past and today. To do that, they could not yet use the site itself, but they created a festival, a uh, Kingston Multicultural Festival that they, they held offsite. Um, in, in 2017, they said, we really need some professional help to move from this vision and this site into an integrated um, project to move forward as a museum. And that's really where, where I come into the, the picture. I was a graduate student and very interested in this kind of work. I once worked at the Tenement Museum uh, along with Kat and was just so excited to hear that there was something similar being started in, in Kingston. And so we set to work. We were wearing masks here in 2017, not because of COVID, but because it was so dusty to go through the, the collections to really get intellectual control over what the story is, what happened here. And what we were able to find, this was my colleague, Samantha Gomez Ferrer, and this was me. Um, what we were able to find is that really the story of this site is the story of multiculturalism, of diversity, of a bunch of different folks coming together because there's delicious bread, but forging new kinds of connections and relationships that lasted beyond this. So the four key themes that we identified through really finding out what happened here were immigration, community, work, and bread. And those four key themes became a part of our mission and became the base point for how the story of the Rears Bakery is spiraling outward to then bring in many, many different folks from different communities and different backgrounds today. So here's what we've done. We created, we recreated the storefront as it would have looked in 1959. Um, so Starting in July, I hope many of you will, will join us. We're going to have um, guided um, educator-led historic bakery tours very much in the same vein as, as the Tenement Museum experience. But we've also been able to use this as a jumping off point for public programs. So the inset photo you see here was a program we did that brought local food entrepreneurs today to share their own stories of adapting their recipe for food from a different country or a different part of this country uh, to be able to serve the local community's palates. What will people like? What will they eat? And what ingredients can they access here in the Hudson Valley? 
So it was a wonderful program and really showcases how we use the immigrant story of our site and the past here to make this relevant and, and significant for folks who are here now. That's not all we do. So we have the historic former bakery aspect of it, this kind of vibrant new museum piece that I'll talk about more in a second, as well as that grassroots community organization doing public programming, bringing folks in and to connect with one another. Um, one way that we're doing it, and I guess another example first of the grassroots piece is through a Kingston Immigrant Oral History Project. This is something we're doing right now. Um, along with the Kingston Library, we have started inviting folks in to be a part of our effort to learn the immigrant stories, both historically and now of folks coming to Kingston. Uh, it has been an amazing experience. We just started in March. Um, I think we have the last recording session on Saturday. I think we have 23 interv interviews from just three recording days. Um, and the ways in which this has helped folks understand who we are and, and uh, for us to understand who they are has been quite profound. And the quote that you see here on the left is from somebody who actually was a part of our first recording session um, and, and shared her perspective of why it felt so important to share her story here. We're not only saying, come be a part of our project, we're also trying to connect immigrants today with resources in our community. So we had a tabling event that included uh, folks from the Ulster Literacy Association, the Kingston Library, the Immigrant Defense Network here in Kingston and several other local nonprofits. And it's been in this amazing opportunity to get to know and share each other's resources and actually coming out of this very first pilot project, the Rear Center and Ulster Literacy Association have met, first of all, and, and realized how similar our needs and our missions are. And we're working on an extension of this project and an expansion throughout Ulster County in order to continue on um, and serve their needs to create a language learning curriculum and our needs to create a really meaningful, vibrant, exhibition and place to be able to bring folks in here. As a part of this project, we also have um, a, a wonderful board member making tin type portraits of the folks who are participating. And this is going to become a part of our exhibition. So more about that exhibition and the kind of museum piece. Our site, um, as I had mentioned, had apartments upstairs, a storefront on the, on the ground floor. And originally this site over here was the hayloft for the delivery horses. And so um, this is what that looked like before that preservation project that was done um, before I got involved. And since my time being here, we've converted this former hayloft into a exhibition space. First in 2018, we opened it in quite rudimentary conditions with lights strung up uh, with clips and very temporary walls. But during the pandemic, we really took this opportunity to hear from our community. This is meaningful. We want a home for immigrant stories and different kinds of programs here beyond just the historic, the recreated historic site. We want a space that's more flexible and we could use as a classroom, program space, et cetera. And so that's just what we've done. And we opened in just two weeks ago on May 7th, our new space, our, our rear center gallery with an exhibition all about sewing in Kingston that features both the history and contemporary makers uh, sharing their stories of, of sewing and what it has me meant to us. So from those core themes of immigration, community, work, and bread, this really pulls on the theme both of immigration and of work. And as you can see, this was our opening day. We've been pulling in many different generations of folks who have worked or have connections within the garment industry. Um, and it's been a real point of pride for folks, you know, who, who may work behind a sewing machine today to come and be able to be featured on the wall of a museum. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about who we are, how this preservation project is fused really with a social justice mission to, for, to, to be able to move both aspects of our work forward in meaningful ways, not only to us, but to our wider community. So thanks so much. And I'm excited for hearing the others. Ah, one more here, just to please find out more and, and to follow us as a part of um, our work and, and your summer plans. Thanks.
Hi guys, uh, next up, uh, my name is Maggie Oldfather. I'm the facilities officer at Henry Street Settlement. And give me one second, I'll share my screen with you and we'll start chatting. Okay. All right. So Henry Street Settlement, as some of you may know and some may not, is not an organization that's dedicated to historic preservation. Henry Street is a social services organization that has endured for 129 years now in the same neighborhood, occupying some of the same buildings. So we ended up preserving buildings because we just kept them for that long. Uh, on the Left-hand side, you'll see Henry Street's original headquarters buildings at 265 and 267 Henry Street. Uh, one of the first outdoor playgrounds in the city was in their backyard and also a music class. And this is just examples of some of the work that Henry was doing, Henry Street was doing back in the day. Uh, Henry Street's founder, Lillian Wald, was set out to preserve life, dignity, and community. And many of the forces that she worked against in the 1890s are still in play today. Say immigration, racism, discrimination, poverty, healthcare access, voting rights, child care, et cetera. And as the needs of the community shift, Henry Street shifts while retaining a focus on a few central tenets, which are each of us is whole and worthy, Poverty is a social issue. There is power in bridging differences. Neighbors matter. And in times of need, act. Today, we occupy and run programming out of 19 buildings on Manhattan's Lower East Side. They date from the 1830s, 1840s, 1870s, 1910s, 1930s, 1960s, 1970s, 1990s, early 2000s, and all the way up to 2019. We have individual landmarks, National Register listed properties, contributing buildings within historic districts, buildings that are eligible for designation but not listed, old buildings with no historic imprimatur, and new buildings. And these buildings are all part of Henry Street's preservation work. We maintain these buildings in order to preserve the community of the Lower East Side, preserve the value of this place in all of its forms, and preserve access to vital social services. There are clear links between preservation and social justice in our work at Henry Street Settlement, and I'll be highlighting four of them for you today. In the aftermath of 9-11, Henry Street opened the Neighborhood Resource Center in one of our individual landmarks, an 1830s federal style row house on East Broadway. At the same time, Fire Company 15, previously located in an 1870s firehouse adjacent to Henry Street's administrative headquarters, merged with another local fire company and moved out of their building. Their truck had been destroyed on 9-11 and the new modern truck wouldn't be able to fit in the old building. So after nearly 130 years of serving the community, the building sat vacant. In 2017, after 10 years of dogged advocacy, Henry Street was able to purchase the building from the city. It would no longer be boarded up, a boarded up eyesore, it wouldn't be demolished to become a vacant lot and it wouldn't be turned into a luxurious home. The firehouse instead became the home of what was now known as the Dale Jones Birch Neighborhood Center, providing a set of first responder services. And after running out of the small three-story residence with steep, narrow steps, staff from the Neighborhood Resource Center are able to invite clients, both new and old, into an accessible building with an elevator right at ground level. We're able to preserve and improve the services we offer, financial, legal, immigration, housing, and healthcare assistance, pairing, parenting advice, and more in a preserved and improved building. Our next project represents a new interpretation of our historic resources. There are many layers of purpose and meaning embedded in all of our buildings. It's unrealistic to think that we can capture all the building's story at any one point. We have to find the threads, pull them through, and tie them down when we can, lest we lose them. Henry Street was recently able to anchor a new thread of meaning for our main headquarters at 265 and 267 Henry Street. With the help of the NYC LGBT Sites Project, 
these two buildings are now listed on both the New York State and National Register in recognition of Lily, Lillian Wald's lesbian identity. These buildings are the living spaces she occupied with her romantic partners. Although the buildings were already listed for the work of the Henry Street Settlement and Lillian Wald, we are thrilled to be able to add this to the broader public's understanding of Wald and Henry Street. While we continue to maintain the buildings, there is no tangible remnant of this story. So we tell the story ourselves and use it to help us guide Henry Street forward. A third piece of the social justice puzzle that Henry Street has tried to engage with isn't the buildings themselves, but the land that they inhabit. Each of Henry Street's facilities has this land acknowledgement posted. This building is situated on the Lenape Island of Manhattan, Manhattan, in the Lenape Hoking, the Lenape homeland. We pay respect to Lenape peoples, past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout the Lenape diaspora. We offer our care and gratitude to the land, water, and air of Lenape Hoking. Lastly, as we reckon with the impacts of climate change, we are reminded that all of these structures are vulnerable to forces much stronger than ourselves. For me personally, every building that I can keep standing represents materials diverted from landfill and embodied energy retained. Every increase in efficiency and cleanliness improves air quality and safety for the community at large. The sustainability inherent in preservation and thoughtful building stewardship is itself a social justice. I don't mean this to sound simple or easy, it is anything but. Henry Street pushed for improved housing conditions for all people and improved conditions came at the cost of thousands of existing buildings when the city founded the New York City Housing Authority in the 1930s and started taking over whole neighborhoods, demolishing existing buildings and building housing developments. We have built new, demolished old and even occupy space in one of the newly constructed Essex Crossings buildings which are bringing about a huge amount of change to our community, both good and bad. Somewhere in all of that confusion, we maintain focus on Lillian Wald's straightforward instructions that guide us to preserve what we can, community, place, and service, while recognizing that the need always changes, and we have to listen thoughtfully and respond as best we can with the tools that we have. As she said 20 years before her own retirement, if the public will continue to encourage us, we are ready to go on, not with a fixed program, but moving with our times. And we continue to do that. Thank you. And I'm gonna pass it on to Jeremy now. Um, thank you, Maggie. I'm just going to share my screen as well. Just gonna give it a moment to load. You should see a um, nice bright red house. Um, hello everyone, my name is Jeremy Dennis. I'm an artist and photographer from the Shinnecock Indian Nation in Southampton, New York. I'm so grateful to be on this panel on social justice and preservation. Um, for my 10 minutes, I'd like to talk a little bit about where I'm from, the Shinnecock Nation as context, along with talking uh, about a space called Ma's House and BIPOC Art Studio, along with its uh, current uh, brief history. And so with this starting slide, this is one of our alumni artists, uh, Bo Brie um, along with Pamela Council, one of her friends that came and visited us at Ma's house and myself on the uh, front stoop. And I um, also wanted to start with a land acknowledgement. I put a little golden star um, where I am today here at Ma's house and on Shinnecock ancestral territory. And we're very lucky to be able to say that as Shinnecock people. And I always like to include land acknowledgements when I present, just because everything that we do um, here, wherever you are in the, in the world, um, depends on the land that we have. And so um, it's always important to acknowledge that, acknowledge the original people of that land and give if you have that capacity. Um, so a little bit about Shinnecock itself. Uh, this is a photo I took of our uh, community center right in the heart of the reservation. But there's about, um, I would say 600 tribal members here on the territory. Um, there's about 1400 of us around the world, which is incredible. And I always like to proudly state that we've been here for uh, more than 10,000 years here on Long Island, New York. And so um, just a little bit of a overview um, from satellite imagery. 
Um, this is what the territory looks like from above. Um, we're surrounded by the Shinnecock Bay on three sides. And you can kind of see um, if you're <laughs> attentive, just some of the surrounding areas where the territory ends, just how um, overdeveloped it is compared to what is, um, I like to think of, especially where I live on the Southern tip um, as sort of a nature reserve. There's just so many birds, wildlife, so many trees, um, but it also is a um, double-edged sword because it's about 800 square acres but the bottom third of that, as you can see, is mostly marshland. So you can't really build um, residences or businesses down there. Uh, this is our tribal seal and our flag. Um, Shinnecock itself is widely known to be translated as people of the stony shore. Um, within the flag itself, you could just see so much symbolism. Um, a lot of people know us for our um, whaling. So we have two right whales indigenous to the Atlantic coast here. We have uh, canoers near the center, the indigenous box turtle with the 13 sections, which uh, for us represent the 13 tribes of Long Island. And um, the yellow itself is um, in relation to both the East Coast, the rising of the sun, hope for a better future. And it's um, also related to the medicine wheel representing the East. And so um, if you look at the Shinnecock Indian um, nation lettering that's part of our wampum material. Um, this is what wampum looks like. So if you've ever been to the Atlantic um, beaches and picked up some of the clamshell, we have a really um, unique phenomenon here in the, um, this part of the world. Um, our clamshells have this purple hue on the edge of their shell. And for thousands of years, um, Shinnecock and other people from the New Jersey coast up to Maine and Canada have been taking this uh, clam or quahog shell and rendering it using beads, rock, and other materials into wampum beads, which is um, really incredible. Uh, perhaps the most famous example of that is the Haudenosaunee belt in upstate New York. And going back, I want to um, talk a little bit about this image. Um, I really love this image because in the center or on the right is my mother, Denise Silva Dennis, who's also an artist and really active here at Ma's house, and she also grew up in the house as well. And her sister, uh, Darlene um, Troge, who also grew up in the house. And so this is one of our um, really important days um, historically at, at Shinnecock. This was taken in 2010 when we received our federal recognition. And what that essentially granted us is a government-to-government -government relationship with the United States. I like to sometimes explain that we're sort of a small country <laughs> within a country. But this map kind of shows you the overwhelming amount of like 570 plus different federally recognized tribes. Um, besides that, as a nation, we're trying to regain what is known as the Shinnecock Hills. So this is a green rectangle showing our territory today versus the land that we're trying to regain through that federal recognition. Uh, here at Shinnecock, we're probably most known for our annual powwow. Unfortunately, for the past two years, we've had to cancel due to COVID. But this year on Labor Day weekends, um, we're going to have the grand four-day event. So please come and join us. It'll um, be an opportunity to appreciate Shinnecock and Indigenous culture and also support a lot of our artists, chefs, and other people who make it possible. And so I want to jump into Ma's house. This is a personal project that was sort of a server serv lining um, project out of COVID. Um, I'm sure all of us experienced cancellations, uh, delays, a lot of our uh, prospects being canceled um, around early 2020. And so my uh, family and I ended up um, as, a, as a collective um, returning to an old home that we grew up in, in the uh, Shinnecock Nation territory. Um, as you can see on the right, um, that's the front facade. And on the left, that's the photo we took during one of our uh, 2020 September benefits. And so that's my older sister, Kelly, and myself, and we're uh, doing a benefit to restore the home that was um, vacant for the past five years uh, at that point. And so just a little bit of history and um, <laughs> old family photos. This is a photo of myself in the foreground. Again, my older sister, Kelly, um, my cousin, Tila, and Al. And on the right, that's my grandmother, Loretta Silva, also belovedly known as Ma. And so Ma passed away when I was only um, eight years old in 1998, but she always had a dream of turning the house 
if nothing else, into a museum for family and Shinnecock um, appreciation. And so going back to the 1960s, I really love this image on the left because it shows my grandfather, Peter Silva uh, Sr., taking recycled materials from a church or a parsonage from 1845 um, built in Riverhead. And he brought all of these different materials, the um, joists, the um, studs, and other materials, and made the original uh, Ma's house using this. And on the right is, again, my um, grandfather, Peter, with a headdress. Um, Ma on the far right, there are six children, and my mom, Denise, on the uh, horse. <laughs> and so, again, the house was vacant for that um, long period just due to um, disrepair, the utilities all not really working. Unfortunately, this is more common than it should be here at Shinnecock. But with the um, free time we had during COVID, we ended up doing a GoFundMe campaign to try to restore the house and save it from collapsing on itself. And so we raised actually over $50,000, which um, if you're from the East End, <laughs> you know, it doesn't go too far. But because of the generosity, um, people were just continually donating. And so this is sort of a before and after of some of the major progress in the front of the house. Um, what we ended up doing through this generosity and reciprocity is really just dedicating the front of the house to public events, um, BIPOC art, um, open studios, exhibits, solo and group shows, and um, more. And so the uh, ongoing pro project of restoring the house is still ongoing. But I have to um, shout out my father, Avery Dennis uh, Jr., for doing a lot of the work with me <laughs> through his retirement. And uh, for me, it's just a really incredible opportunity to not only restore a family home and a historic uh, site here at Shinnecock, but to also um, bring it new life, build on top of the already um, really rich history here. And along with um, sort of using it as a home, as a studio, and as a public space, we also have a residency program for artists of color. This is really incredible to me because we ask each artist to create work inspired by uh, Shinnecock history, our culture, the land itself, or some of our current issues. It's also a great opportunity to have cross-cultural appreciation just because of the um, disparity between um, race and economics here on the East End. And so this is Yan Yan. Um, Ali, a screenwriter and um, comedian. We have work by um, Pamela Allen, um, Bo Bri as I showed you in the first slide. Uh, this is Shane Weeks, who's also Shinnecock, an artist and historian leading a history class. Um, I also do work on history, so this is finally a venue that we can actually have as a physical site for this um, type of work and appreciation. And this is just another image of the renovation itself. This used to be my parents' uh, bedroom that we turned into the year-round residency room. Um, we can show you more on our website, but one of the really cool things I want to show is that um, uh, last year we had Teen Vogue actually come and do a story on Ma's house, and many of our Shinnecock youth were actually involved. Some of them went on to continue modeling and um, build up those connections. And so if you want to support Ma's House, we have different merch. The um, honey, unfortunately, ran out this year, <laughs> very popular item. But um, in October of last year, we started a nonprofit status just so that we could um, support um, social justice type of art. I believe that type of work is underfunded and undersupported. And so it's really amazing that at Ma's House, we can do a um, nonprofit route in order to support artists who are um, usually institutionally um, underfunded or not really looked at or supported, um, even though they're full-time artists. And so I do want to um, just mention briefly um, about Native-led nonprofits. Um, even though Native people are just 2.9% of the U.S. population, we only receive about 0.4% um, of philanthropic dollars. So there's a huge disparity there. But I, I personally believe it's part of the continued um, rendered invisibility of indigenous people. And so as Ma's House, we try to be as public and inclusive and as inviting as possible to try to break down that barrier. And so I want to end, I know it's a lot of info <laughs> just on my contact. And if you really love Instagram or social media, you can follow our project on that platform. Um, thanks for your time.
I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Jeremy. You can really feel that sense of welcome and Ma's dream um, being realized through your work. Um, and thank you, Maggie and Sarah. We can all come back on now. And um, we already have a couple of questions from um, the uh, audience, um, but I wanna start with sort of the questions that really generated from the conversation we'd had um, as we were planning this and sort of the issues that arose as we were discussing our work. Um, folks watching, please share more questions um, and comments in the chat for us to bring in throughout. Um, you know, you each it each mentioned um, community and the the people that you you work with, um, and so um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that from each of you. Right? How do you think about the relationships um, that you hold and foster within your work? How do you think about working with community and neighbors um, and uh, sharing a little bit more about um, how how those connections and uh, sort of manifest for you all? uh so we didn't pick an order for answering these questions whoever feels compelled jump in um so i think i'll jump in um henry street is its own neighbor <laughs> in a lot of ways i mean we occupy so many sites down here and have programs in so many places that the people we employ are the people who were served by us as kids and then, you know, end up getting jobs through our youth programming and moving on to greater things outside of Henry Street, and then maybe returning to be members of our senior center. Um, so it is, it is this feeling, this very deep feeling of community and of family that really does go all the way back to Lillian Wall. I mean, she lived at the settlement house specifically to create family. And she created her family um, and her queer social circle and lived with all of these women nurses and directly ministered to the community. And we kind of, we still do the same thing today. We are the community and they are us um, and there's a lot of listening that has to be done though, because the community has changed and continues to change and will never stop changing. It's the nature of New York, it's the nature of life. Um, and we try to respond as best we can to new needs, but because we're positioned the way we are as so intricately linked with the community, it's easy to figure out what those needs are because people know that they can come to us. Yeah, absolutely. And that that sense of um, that the staff are of the community and themselves were served by Henry Street. So you can really see that sort of ancestral um, connection to the people in the neighborhood. I can jump in unless other than I guess Jeremy, but, um, you know, I, for us, it's our mission is to foster belonging. Um, and so this idea of really deep relationship building and real inclusion, inviting folks to be a part of, to, to, <laughs> to express and, and shape what this all is, is, is what our, we're all about. I think it's also interesting from an organizational side, it's a survival strategy as a brand new organization. If you have a staff of one, which we did up until January, we hired our second staff person, you can't do anything on your own. And so to be able to really get to meet other folks, I mean, I spend as much time as I can listening. I think it's such an important point that, that Maggie picked up on. What, it, what are you doing? What, are you, what do you need? Whether it's a dance company in town, a local business, a fellow nonprofit, an arts organization, somebody who participates in one of these oral history interviews, what, what are then ways that we can work together to serve both of our needs, right? And, and share resources and really be shaped by. Um, and I think in one piece with this too is the significance of advisory councils, right? There are some things that like we need to do, <laughs> like for example, getting the funding to make this, this um, gallery a possibility, right? Or we, you know, 
this was an exhibition that, that we wanted to put forward, but how do we do those things in a way that's taking into account and taking into consideration all of the various voices and needs of different folks who will then want to use those spaces or, you know, it's not like we're telling your story, it's come be a part of shaping how this story is told and, and put your voice as a part of it. So um, I think some of those ways are, are, are kind of, that's kind of a little bit about how it's really become a hallmark of what we do is, is partner broadly. Um, and it's been an amazingly successful way also of being able to move forward as our own institution. Mm, that's really, also too, just considering what are the formal and informal ways that you're building relationships, fostering relationships. Um, and actually just Sarah, while you were sharing uh, some of what you said connected to a question um, that someone had that I'll just bring in here um, about what are some of the specific social justice problems in Kingston that the Rear Center is actively working to address. So like, what have you heard from people as you're asking what they need? Um, and they continue that the Rare Center is doing a lot of great work to promote intercultural awareness, inclusion. Um, are there any in particular like equity building initiatives that you have? Yeah, I think it's a really important question. There are a lot of there are a lot of challenges going on in Kingston right now. I mean, one of the one of the really um, the the crazy things that are happening at the same time is both there is an influx of new immigrants who are moving here and there's an influx of new folks who are coming up from New York City. And so part of what in terms of that inclusion piece, part of what we work to do is to have places and experiences where those folks are meeting and building relationships with each other in order to make for a sort of stronger social fabric within the overall city. You know, that's a piece of work that we can do. It, there are housing crises, right? We're, we're hearing about that. There's, there, there's racism, there's anti-Semitism. The local uh, federation just launched a, a hotline to report anti-Semitism. So there are many, many different kinds of, of problems that exist here. And part of what we're trying to do is build relationships, create sources and ways for folks to create connections with one another and really get to know each other as one piece of, of solving that. In terms of the equity part, the, the, the narrative, the story that's told about Kingston's history has traditionally been either sort of the first state, right? We have the, the Senate House, the first capital rather of New York, right? This very um, kind of colonial focused history or industrial focused history in terms of the history with the canal and the shipping and the transportation networks. So a lot of what we're doing in the oral history project is a great example of that is to say, let's let's actively seek out and create <laughs> these voices as a part of the histories that we know and tell and can give to researchers to be able to then write their own narratives and books and stories and make art pieces and all this other stuff about it. So I think right now, and you know, we've done that even just on the outside of our building, we have interpretive panels telling the history of this neighborhood that includes the indigenous history, that includes the history of enslaved peoples here. Histories that as far as I know, don't exist on any other public signage in, in our city. So that's just a couple of examples of, of the ways we're doing this. Thank you. And Jeremy, um, thinking about community and relationships, we can return back to, to that question um, before we move on. Oh, sure. Um, well, in Suffolk County in the East End, we um, struggle with um, just segregation and um, like gated communities. And just if you look at Google Maps, you can just point um, at different um, disparities and just different racial groups being separated. And so what we're trying to do at Ma's house is just um, bridge the um, bridge the different communities and offer space. I think when you look at indigenous values and um, values of community, we're the ones who um, I, I think are sort of the <laughs> utopian dream of like, everyone's included, everyone can be supported, we can find room for everyone. That's, that's the original story of this country. And so um, I think that we're trying to return to those traditions, return to um, like different ways of living and creating that example. Um, especially here at Ma's house, we don't have a lot of like funds. We don't have a lot of space, but we're trying to create a model that other, maybe other institutions can follow or they can um, refer to us or consult. 
and we can just collaborate and um, build new structures of um, building community. And so um, just for Shinnecock tribal members, um, it's ourselves. Um, we, we live on a territory that's uh, Shinnecock Indian Nation territory, but a lot of people refer to it as a reservation. And so I, I try to create um, opportunity for people to come and visit us just because people sometimes have fears or prejudice about the safety of coming to Shinnecock versus um, allowing Shinnecock people to feel like they belong in other places outside of the borders. Just because like on both sides of the equation, people just equate reservations to just restricting native people. That's where they belong and nothing else. And so I think through art, we're able to um, create new connections in that way. Thank you. So that was, you know, I think, really helpful too, just to see the the overlaps between the the ways that you all are are thinking about community relationships and the possibility for those relationships to help break down stereotypes, um, to you know, work towards um, solutions, and and really trying to see beyond um, things that we've ever seen to be possible before, right? Really using that like imaginative piece. And so this next question is sort of taking us more into the imaginative piece. Um, I mean, you've all already raised um, the idea of funding as um, you know something that has, has been crucial to the preservation work that you've done, whether it was state grants or grassroots funding for Ma's House. So um, this also too, there was a, a audience member who, who just raised the question of how to get folks on board with the funding for historic preservation if you hear sort of like preservation is not our mission. Um, and so thinking about kind of merging that question of like how to get folks on board with the importance of funding um, preservation work, um, what does your ideal sort of like funding picture look like for the work that you all do um you know this um surely is uh, an issue that um you know folks who are listening are are dealing with so we'd love to hear any reflections and thoughts you have on this too um but i'm curious right imagining into to the possibilities what what would what would funding for your, this work look like I jumped in first last time. I guess I'll jump in first again. Um, Go for it. So there, there's, you know, funding is available for these big projects and projects that you can clearly define what your outcome is and produce something physical at the end. Um, and it's really always funding for the unglamorous projects that we struggle with, but it is exactly those unglamorous projects that sometimes provide the most important uh, resources. So, you know, when they do, when you do come along, we try to jump at them. Um, you know, when I, I first started at Henry Street in 2015, and the first thing I did was apply for a state grant to get generators on two of our buildings because the Lower East Side was impacted severely by Hurricane Sandy. And we were trying to serve the community, but we're also struggling with the community as well. Um, and we got that grant and we've got those generators now, but that's not a project that you can shop around to a lot of different folks because it's not, pretty there's there's a big steel box on the roof now like ooh, it's not exciting it's not um gonna generate buzz um but it is absolutely critical to our ability to respond to the needs of our community and it, and it, the same goes for even smaller projects if it's you know just straightforward maintaining our existing systems and making sure that we can replace floors when they need to be replaced it's just really really baseline stuff um, that we do at henry street we have the ability to work that into operating budgets and contracts that we have with the city but i know that that's not that's not always the case for folks who are doing this work and how do you how do you do that? How do you do the basic 
upkeep and the basic maintenance of your building and find the funding for that. Because if you can't do that, then you're going to lose your building, right? It's going to decay. So that's what I think we need. Thanks, Maggie. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, Jeremy, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to jump in as well. Um, I'm just speaking as a nonprofit that has existed for less than a year, but um, <laughs> it feels like more and more like nonprofit non profit should only exist or can only exist if they are endowed with a huge um, amount of money in the first place. Just because we are applying for things for basic things like keeping the lights on or operational costs. And we're just facing things like, oh, you don't have your 990 or you don't have three years of operation, so we don't want to fund you. And so these are different foundations that could fund us for five years and not even notice <laughs> in their budget. And we're just um, just trying to operate it all. So um, one of the things that we're really um, happy about is I think we have a very, um, I think in my opinion, a very public and um, mutually beneficial mission as an organization. Like we just want to help underserved um, artists of color. And I think a lot of people recognize, especially after like Black Lives Matter in 2020, that um, like communities of color like deserve to be supported in ways that they're not. And a lot of people in the area especially could um, help in that regard. And maybe there is some sort of ode, um, like balance, or <laughs> a lot of people at Shinnecock say like the rents do, but uh, <laughs> just as a humorous take on it. But I, I just hope that there's like less of like individuals who are trying to pay the bills themselves as well, who do have a, a conscience and just empathize with the mission. I hope it transitions away from that to those who live in the area, they live like 10 minutes away, or top one percenters, and like they could just help. And um, yeah, I, I would just say that, yeah. I'll echo what, what both of, of you guys said. I think, you know, the unsexy projects, I think is a really important, <laughs> an important part of that. We were able, and just as an example, right, we knew that because, and, and this is the other point I wanna make. So the community work, the engagement, the purpose of the place that you're preserving inspires the funds to preserve it, right? So if I had just gone out and said, hey, we need money to put electricity and plumbing, we wanna make a gallery to immigrant stories, that's not the same as saying, here's a space, come put on an exhibition, make, you know, this is the purpose, look what we've done now, we wanna do more, please give the money for that, right? It's much harder to do that with the other building where the, where the roof is leaking, right? We can't, we, it's very, and it's a lot bigger chunk of change that we need to get. So I think that that's, a, that's I'm making two different points. One is the purpose I think can really help. And that's one of the things that I'm seeing so much is that capital funding and programs funding are separate pools and separate grants. And in order to make the case that preservation is essential, we need to think about why, for who, and that's where some of these questions about equity come in once again, right? Which spaces are not being preserved? Whose stories don't have a visible plot on the landmark in order to really step in the footsteps of this immigrant Jewish baker who stood here, right? I think that, that that's a piece of it too. So I'm, I'm making a number of different points, but I think one of them is that the community involvement is essential in order to make sure that we're preserving places that have really important stories to tell, that we're then using those stories, and that maybe then a way of getting funding for less sexy projects is being able to wed the idea of what we could do in this place and who wants that with the reality that it costs a lot of money to fix a roof and all the decking and all that stuff. Thank you all. I mean, this question too, I feel like we could stay on this topic for probably the rest of the, the conversation. Um, and there's been a, a lot of response in the, the chat just a, around thinking about how we dream into to new structures um, for funding that the work that we do and how just, you know, you've all made that point of like how important that intersection of purpose and like what and who is this all for, um, how crucial that is to making the case for why, um, why funding is necessary um, for, for the work. Um, so 
we've just touched on this a little bit in in Sarah, what you just raised about sort of whose stories are told and um, whose stories are told in um, in physical spaces that are preserved. But um, in our our conversation preparing for this event, um, you know, I think a few of you raised the idea of how do we think about preserving things that are not there or talking about and interpreting history of communities or buildings that are demolished. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious your reflections on that, right? Like how, how do we um, bring life to, to spaces or people, uh, communities that are no longer present? Um, and, and this might also connect to Nancy, one of the audience members has a question sort of about how preservation should not just be about buildings, but about cultural traditions too, and sort of like preserving the intangible. So maybe weaving sort of your thoughts on that into sort of how you or your site sort of think about preserving what's not physically there anymore. We don't have to have Maggie go first, but if Maggie, you wanna go first, you can. Sure. Um, so I think I, I touched on this in my presentation with two of the items. One is um, Lillian Wald's uh, queer identity. And as I said, like it's, it's represented in the existence of physical structures, but there's, there's no, sign that says, hey, a lesbian lived here and she was important. I mean, I think we're, we're moving towards that as we gain recognition. Um, but I guess the way that we approach it is just making sure that internally everyone here is aware that that is part of the story that we have and that is part of the story that we're telling. Um, the other thing that I wanted to state, I realized I had a picture of it in my presentation, but I didn't, um, I didn't touch on it, is uh, Emily Johnson, who helped us develop our land acknowledgement. She has also been holding monthly uh, um, gatherings over a fire pit that are uh, inspired by her Native history and experience and uh, as a way to not just acknowledge the land, but acknowledge some of that cultural history as well. Um, and that's that's always gonna be a more challenging thing to do, especially for us, since we're not a preservation organization and we're not dedicating ourselves to these things specifically. So what we're dedicating ourselves to is making sure that the, the people are here and that the people are safe and giving them space to be able to continue having whatever traditions they have. So by preserving the buildings, we're giving the community the ability to continue to be resilient and to be who they are. I can, I can speak some to this. You know, a part of the history of Kingston and of the Rondat neighborhood, especially, that I didn't talk about in my presentation um, is this is a site of urban renewal. And so for us, the, the fact that we're on the west side of Broadway and not the east side has made all the difference. Um, we're the only building left that's been preserved of what used to be this multi-ethnic, multi-racial working class neighborhood. So one of the things we've been struggling with is a desire to really be able to share that story and tell that story, even though you can't see it, right? Those buildings have been torn down. And so it's it's in our plans to, to come up with ways. And I'm excited to learn from you all and, and especially also from the Tenement Museum, as I understand this is another piece of the work you've been doing recently, um, to, to be able to, to interpret things you can't see, which when I was first learning was sort of the cardinal sin, right, of, of doing a walking tour, for example. Um, but it's so important. So many times there are folks who come into, you know, literally they open the door and start sniffing and say, does it still smell like the bakery here? And then story after story comes up of having grown up in this neighborhood and, and what it meant to them to come to this place. So, 
you know, it speaks to the significance of preserving our site so that those memories and those intangible, talk about an intangible tradition, right? The, the bread and that experience of a Sunday tradition after church, um, that that remains, but then there's so many other pieces of that, that that we know we can and need to build out from there. Um, and I was going to jump in because this feels like a <laughs> very good topic for indigenous history. Um, like it, we've been here for so long and so much of our sites and cultural sites and places where we hold ceremony have been um, built over or demolished or desecrated. And so um, one of the models that are um, here in Suffolk County or the East End is a community preservation fund. And it's just a 2% tax on all real estate exchanges. And we use this um, often to preserve some of our sacred sites that are still remaining. And so I really um, like that um sort of um process but there's also the uh, plain sight project in the east end that um aims to recognize the different um stories of enslaved and free um, people of color in the east end in suffolk county and so they're doing different things from um, road signs to uh, bricks that lay out the history of different houses and sites and just trying to recognize um from monuments to street names to um, historic buildings, like places where there was slavery and people just um, just ignore that history or don't think it was here in New York. And so that from that to indigenous um, sites, I think there's a lot of work to do uh, beyond like just land acknowledgements that are brief and like on the front of buildings, like maybe those buildings need to be returned if they're on unceded land. So there's a lot of work to be done um, just in the theme of social justice. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. And certainly we, in our preparation, had, had talked about, right, what does preservation look like on unceded land? And what are those sort of real tangible material, um, you know, aspects of the, the work that can um, restore or you know, pay the rent, um, as, as you mentioned. Uh, and, you know, I, I think, too, that's when we, we talk about this question of justice, right? Like, what, what does success look like in that that's actually one of the audience members brought that up so I'll, I'll save that towards the end of the conversation but you know i think that's it's probably on on everyone's mind too right how do we know when we've when we're succeeding in in the work that we're doing um and actually too just sarah since you mentioned um what we're doing at the Tennessee museum i will share just a little bit on on this question we were just um discussing around you know preserving and, and interpreting um stories and spaces that are no longer there. Um, the museum really after, um, you know, decades of staff and visitors, um, you know, challenging us to do this work, we have developed um, a couple of initiatives around interpreting Black and African American history um, here in the Lower East Side. And we have a walking tour um, that visits five sites. And at three of the five, what we're interpreting is no longer there. Right. And so how through walking tours and storytelling can we invite people to to understand how the landscape has changed and why it has changed and how racism and displacement have impacted whose stories and buildings are preserved in the city. So that's been a really, um, you know, an initiative we've been doing, you know, really joining um, so many people in, in New York who've already been working to, um, you know, help uh restore the history of black and african-american communities to lower manhattan um i see someone in the chat just mentioned black gotham um please check out kamal Ware's work at black gotham if you're not familiar with it he's an artist who's doing incredible work restoring not only through walking tours but through visual art um restoring the history of people of african descent to lower manhattan um and and certainly right thinking about the role that artists play in in that um in that effort uh, so um, the, the next thing, too, that the Town Museum is working on is to actually, um, through our, our preservation project over the next eight months, the end result will be a, a recreated tenement apartment of a Black family who lived in a tenement a little bit further west that has since been demolished. And so although that family didn't live at 97 Orchard Street, um, it's important enough to the Tenement Museum that a wider public understands that Black history is tenement history. Um, for us to actually change the model of what we do. We've actually never told the story of a family who didn't live in our building, um, but you know, 
in our, our discussions, it, you know, we sort of realized, right, it's actually more important to be able to, to, you know, widen who we think about when we think about tenements and um, expand that. That's more important than it is that we, we only tell the stories of people who lived in our building. Um, and so the, the next question I want to bring in from, from Anna, um, which was also a question that we'd, we'd already talked about, but just how, how do each of your organizations engage with um, new development um, or overdevelopment or gentrification in, in your areas? Um, you know, what has that looked like for all of you? So it, it can look messy, I think, as Anna pointed out in her question, you know, the demolition of East River Park has been incredibly challenging. Um, and in our immediate neighborhood, you can find people on all sides of um, save it, preserve it, demolish it. Um, and it's, I, I don't, I can't state what position Henry Street officially takes. I don't know that we officially take a position. All we know is we are here to support the folks who are struggling and struggling with it. Um, we engage with new development because it's a reality. And so, as I said in my presentation, one of our job development programs is located in Essex Crossing. And Essex Crossing, for those who don't know, was built on land that was taken for slum clearance in the 60s and sat completely vacant for 40 years. Um, and that was incredibly hard on the community. And the construction process of the new buildings that are going up has also been hard on the community. And the best that we can do is take advantage of the fact that there is space in that building for us to be able to continue to serve the residents, some of whom were given spots in the new buildings. Um, but a lot of people tried to fight for them and didn't get those spots. Um, it's, it's one of the ways that the Lower East Side is constantly changing. We're actively, you know, struggling with gentrification. Um, new towers going up that, you know, devalue other existing properties. And I don't know that there's any one way that we can approach it because everything, it, it's all so dependent on what is going to be a give back to the community when, what is the reality of that give back? Is it um, just kind of a placebo or is it real? Thanks, Maggie. And Sarah, Jeremy, did you have any, any thoughts to add to how development and change has impacted your work? Uh, I'll just speak briefly. Um, luckily here at Shinnecock, we have um, a lot of territory relatively that is um, underdeveloped and still left as uh, environment or nature and maintains the identity of our um, history. And so um, outside of the territory, unfortunately, it's become so um, unaffordable that like, the connections that we're making with um, young um, artists of color, like we can't really maintain um, like engaging with them long term. Like if we want to have them come back, if we want to build a stronger community or hire um, people of color to work at Ma's house, um, I don't know how much like fundraising we would have to do to just get them a, a small house in this area. And so I think that has been really detrimental, not only to the reservation, but also just the um, East End in general, which is like so much overdevelopment. Um, I think people um, identify the East End as um, <laughs> existing for that reason. Like you build your house, you go in the summer and that's it. So we're trying to um, kind of change that perception and, and many other perceptions. 
And here in Kingston, it's it's a huge topic. Um, unfortunately, it's more often a topic where people are not talking to each other, they're talking at each other. And so part of the work that we're doing through programming anyway, is to try to create inroads through the history of what happened here to create opportunities to really actually talk to each other. So we just had a program last month about um, the role of small businesses in gentrifying neighborhoods, small and immigrant businesses, and sort of had a really, really engaging and thoughtful conversation among actually also a, a, a writer, an author who wrote a fiction novel about it, The Beautiful Thing That Heaven Bears, and sort of using that fiction as a jumping off point to bring in both the history of what happened at Rear's Bakery and, and the relationship here, as well as local businesses today. So using our history, again, as a way of getting into contemporary topics, bringing folks in to engage with each other, um, kind of outside of the, the very political fray, I think is one answer to this question. Another one is, um, you know, yet to be determined in a way there, the city of Kingston is going through a zoning, a rezoning process and plan. And so it's very possible that all the, you know, literally uh, I'm looking out the window across the street is a field that is the result of urban renewal when those buildings were torn down. And so figuring out and, and positioning, you know, ourselves as an institution within this changing landscape is challenging. I'm, I'm not going to lie. It's really hard to figure out um, what the best ways and rules are for, for our institution um, to be a part of of this changing landscape um, and, and to know that there are people who are displaced today and there are people who were displaced from here then. And what do we do to stop that from continuing to happen? Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Sarah. I mean, and, and certainly too, just looking at the question of what role does an organization play um, and how that might depend on, on who your organization is and what your mission is. Um, and you know, we've had a, a question too on just how we think about balancing mission needs with preservation um, practices um, in, in the, the work that we do. Um, and then a third component of that is balancing the, the community needs and, and sort of what you hear um, coming from the, the people that you're working with. Um, and, and certainly for the, the Tenor Museum too, that this has been a, a question for our entire history, right? What, has, what role has the Tenor Museum played in preservation or gentrification of the neighborhood? And I just saw Margot in the chat was um, just raising a, a question about the Tenor Museum's role with preservation. And I can't speak to that era of the, the move for a historic district because I wasn't, I wasn't part of the Tenor Museum at that point, but um, Certainly, it's a, a really critical question um, within the, the work that we're doing of what, um, how do we think about our own histories as organizations if we've been around for longer? Um, how do we think about our own organizational histories as informing the, the work that we're doing today? So, um, and, and what, what does preservation mean, right? Preservation of community, of place, of buildings, um, of traditions, right? And all the different ways that preservation can look. And so we we just have a, a oh, Sarah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's just jumping off of that and thinking about the question that Frank asked about sort of the interiors of both the Rear Center Gallery and Moss House looking very different um, than they did. I think that that is, it was absolutely an important part of the conversations that we had with a number of different community stakeholders. How do we, you know, this was a space that was a hayloft, right, for, for horses. And here we are making it into a gallery, classroom, public program setting. It had to change. It had to look different in order to serve the needs of the community. And also, and, and maybe this is a, a controversial thing to say in this setting, but I do think that the ethos of it, the idea of what this bakery was, in order to preserve that, we needed to change some of the physical interiors. And we didn't lose all of the, the historic brick. You can see some behind me. And, you know, we really found a way that we felt for our community that we could balance these two different kind of needs to, to keep it looking as it did and, and, re and respect the architectural aspects of preservation, but also to, to change it, to update it so that we could use it to serve the ethos of what this history was and make it meaningful for folks now. 
Thanks, Sarah. And um, um, actually, too, since Frank's question referenced the interior of Ma's house, Jeremy, was there anything you wanted to add to sort of how you balance the mission and preservation practices of the physical space? Oh, sure. I align a lot with Sarah's response as well. I, I feel like Ma's house is sort of a living history. And I also, <laughs> since I was heavily involved in the renovation, it feels like it was never really finished. So that's another consideration. Like, how do you preserve something that like, has holes in the wall or has never had drywall and other things that um, I think we just take for granted? So I think it, we're kind of like building it to the state that was the dream. Like my grandfather wanted to work up to that, but things didn't work out. So we're completing the work in a way. Mm. Really I'm thinking about fulfilling um, the dreams or or goals or mission um, actually sort of brings us to where I wanted to, to wrap up our conversation today um, with this question of, you know, what, what does, success look like for for you? What are the ways that you think about, you know, the attendee, I'm not sure who asked this question, but um, just how does this look in our everyday lives and neighborhoods as we're thinking about success as well? So um, I think let's let's wrap up with with some of our reflections on how we think about whether we know we're doing the work or not. I'm not sure I have an answer for that one, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Um, I mean, I think Henry Street knows we're doing the work if people are coming to our door um, and actively seeking us, and if we are also actively seeking them out. And it's that, um, that that's what we're really striving for here. And the role of preservation in that is to be a physical place where that can happen. And that is a welcoming place. It is a place where anyone can come in whatever they form they are in that day um, and be here with us. Um, but we also recognize that there's work on us to do. And that's why we, you know, we have our land acknowledgement, which as Jeremy said, it's, you know, it's, it's minor. It's a, it's a plaque at the entry, um, but it can be the starting point for a conversation um, and expand the understanding of others who are coming into our site to what else is going on here and what else is happening. I don't know that there's going to be a point at which we'll say, okay, yeah, we did it. We're succeeding. We're, we're doing social justice. Um, it's a process. It's not a I'm not sure I see an end result that we can we can aim for. I'm just reminded of Lillian Wald's quote, right, of constantly responding to where the work is going. Yeah, I guess that's that's kind of where I'm where I'm at right now is how how can I know what success is today when it may look very different in 10 years? Yeah, and that we have to keep in mind and whatever success I may feel I that we've achieved today could be totally different then. I certainly relate to that idea of responsiveness, you know, that that the, the it's going to be an, if we're succeeding, then the goal is ever changing, because as the community is changing, as the needs that we're hearing are changing, then we need to keep adjusting and, and you know, pivoting to use the language that became so common during the pandemic. Um, but I think that it's really important to have, um, you know, for us, what that will look like is for folks who come here to to experience a, a sense of discovery and joy um, of the multicultural society that we live in, um, to have new connections, to have understanding and, and be inspired to engage in continuing to, um, to make for a, a better world. I mean, to, to say it most bluntly, I think that's really the goal is for folks to connect, to recognize and, and learn about difference 
and to be able to move and take that and those relationships out of here and, and to keep um, bringing us forward. Um, I, mean, I agree with Sarah, just making a better world. I think nonprofits just have that mission of um, serving the public, serving the public good. Um, what does your immediate community need? How can you fulfill that? And um, as an art organization, we're just trying to share any resources that we have to those who come out and seek it, and also um, just um, creating avenues for those who can create change to bring it to um, either Moss House or um, just be a hub for expanding the reach of those resources. So it, it's about connecting and just making sure that people know that there's a support system in that way. And I might just add one more thing, which I think is the significance of history to this, right? That it's that this, the fact that we're in a historic place, that there is something really, people learn in so many different ways, right? And I think being able to physically have your body in a space is a really profound one to understand and to connect with what happened here and with what's happening now in your life and the life of somebody you meet in that place. And so we can't do it without spaces like this, without the preservation and you know, without the, the roof being fixed so that we can continue to build out and, and do what we need to. Um, so I just, I didn't want that piece to be lost because it's, it's the core for us. All of this came out of understanding what happened here in this space in the past. And so we need to, to keep this space in order to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think we see that in all of your work, right? How this physical place and places that you are honoring, how that generates your programming, your services, your relationships, and um, that, that that physical space is absolutely fundamental um, to your, your work and to imagining what success looks like now and what success looks like in the future. So thank you all so much, Maggie, Sarah, Jeremy, um, for uh, this conversation, for sharing your work with us. Um, there are many um, comments of praise in the chat. Um, thank you so much, Katie and the Preservation uh, League of New York for hosting us. Um, please um, you know, click on all the links, visit if you weren't familiar with any of these sites before, um, visit and learn more. And I know Katie, you mentioned in the chat that there will be a blog as well with a collection of all of the links. So if you weren't able to access from the chat, um, just keep your eye out and um, you'll be able to, to access those. So thank you all again. I'll turn it back to Katie to close us out. Yes, thank you all. Thank you all so much for um, your time and your expertise and all the great work that you're doing. I love these projects um, in part because they think they help show that preservation does not need to look one way. It does not need to be one thing. Um, the way we do our work can take lots of different forms and um, there is room for being community focused, being social justice focused to exist alongside preservation. They don't need to be mutually exclusive. There's, there's so much opportunity for preservation to be intersectional. And I think all three of you represent really great examples of how that work is being done. And especially in terms of like Ma's house being, it's a family house, like, and that's important too. Like preservation can like get out of its shell to be like, it doesn't have to be a fancy building. It can be a vernacular structure. It can be somebody's house and it can be repurposed in this really amazing way to serve its community. So all of you are doing such good work. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you to everybody who tuned in. As Kat mentioned, um, there will be a follow-up blog that has the recording of this. So if you wanna send it to people because you loved it so much, that's great. We encourage you to do that. Um, if you subscribe to our e-newsletter and our social media, you'll be able to find links to that. It'll be on our website shortly. Um, and we hope that you tune in for another webinar at some point down the road. We have a few more coming up with some great conversations um, focused on sustainability, deconstruction, uh, disability justice, and public art and preservation. So lots of good things on the calendar and lots more good conversations to come. So thank you all so much. And yeah, I hope we see you again soon for another League event in the future. Thanks, Katie. Thank you for putting this together.